Okay, welcome everybody to the first meeting of the year. Uh, we've got no apologies, so we've got a full team. Are there any conflicts of interest or any uh, new interests that, that we should be aware of around the table? For me, no. Okay. No, okay, no resolution is required. No matters lying on the table and there's no public forum today. So the agenda um, has been circulated part of the papers. So I'll move that the agenda be confirmed with no alterations. Got a seconder? Second. Thank you, Nikki. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Gary, thank you. We've got the minutes of the 12th of December, 23. We've got a mover for those that have been circulated. Happy to. Yeah, Nikki, got a seconder? Yes. Uh, yeah, Mr. But, Chairman, I just yes. want to pick out a couple of little editorial. Sorry. Uh, okay. On page, page eight, uh, okay. the motion of Mr. Moran, seconded by Councillor Mr. Copeland. I think you don't get Mr. Copeland to councillor anymore. I just want to take out the councillor. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and on page nine, you've got the motion of Chair Glanning. I think, I don't know, were you cheering? Oh, <laughs> no. Okay. So just a couple of editorials. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't significantly change the minutes. It's just to tidy them up. Is that right? Yeah, thanks, Lyle. That's great. Sorry, I missed that. Okay, so you're happy to move then? Well, I thought it's been moved in second. Okay. Right, yeah. okay. We'll take that. And all those in favour, carry. Thank you. Right, uh, risk and compliance update. So we've got Gareth. You can come forward, please. With your permission, Chair, and perhaps I just uh, take the committee through the executive summary in terms of main items in my report. As usual, there's a fair amount in there. It follows the same structure as the standard report, but there are uh, a few uh, additional items uh, for consideration. So, um, it covers off where we are at with our current risk register and associated dashboard. So, it notes that um, at the time of writing, and uh, that would have changed, it changes on a week by week basis, but at the time of writing, we had 34 tier one risks. That tends to be fairly uh, consistent. Um, and at the time of writing, we had 369 uh, tier two risks. Um, you will know that that's less than we presented at the workshop a few days ago. Um, various reasons for that. Um, I did mention some of those at the council workshop um, in terms of risks associated with Three Waters reform. We have also removed the number of duplicate risks, so the same risks that were raised by different parts of the building uh, business, sorry, and consolidated those. Um, we've identified a new risk. That's one of the risks that we've consolidated into um, the lack of an organisational wide uh, customer relationship management system. Um, so we're currently working through what the appropriate response will be to that. Just to note that we implemented a risk treatment plan, some of the controls in our wildfire uh, risk treatment plan process. Hopefully, uh, members of the committee are aware of that. In terms of our compliance management, um, as we've previously reported to the committee, we have a uh, list of external mandatory obligations. Uh, we've previously taken you through our intentions to implement a compliance management framework and associated policy. Um, the uh, ELT uh, only yesterday considered again uh, the external mandatory obligations register and the approach to communication will, will be uh, via our leadership team meeting um, at the appropriate time. So we're currently working through that process. Um, we've previously reported to the committee that Aon, our insurance broker, uh, visited six of our main assets. That's in preparation of our material damage or principally for our material damage policies that are up for renewal um, in just over a month's time. Um, they uh, obviously created several recommendations. We reported those previously to you. There's a summary. I'm happy to take any questions on that. But it's a summary of the report 
the status of those, which um, I suppose overall is that a fair amount of action has been taken to close out most of those recommendations already. Yeah, Gareth uh, to Stuart, um, as I've stated in previous meetings, it would be good if that program of assessing the major assets continues. So it's not just those six that we have it on a rolling cycle, uh, because I think it's good value and other organisations I'm involved in, uh, we do that. Yeah, absolutely. And that is our intent. Um, we're guided by Aon in terms of what's important to them for each renewal. Um, we have a standard process for valuations as well, where we rotate through our assets and we will um, chair, uh, obviously do a continued review for the purpose of our material uh, damage policies on a year by year basis. Um, so happy to note that and I'll uh, obviously continue to report any progress in that space to the committee. Thank you. The chair, the chair on that one, uh, there's a tie-up between what Aon do and the internal auditing of this type of thing. Are we, uh, so our internal auditing does a similar type of thing, but on a, on a greater scale or covering more areas or what? So there's, there's probably two components to that. Um, we have each of our uh, parts of the business that are responsible for assets, they do their own checks of things like fire safety systems, which is part of the Aon review. Um, we don't currently have in our um, our insurance program um, an audit to have further oversight from uh, the internal auditor on things like that, because it's not uh, something necessarily that we're seeing as a major risk, the, uh, the owners of the, the buildings in terms of the part of the business that operate those assets do those reviews. It's principally around security and fire safety is what they do from the material damages um, review. Yeah, just if I could um, add, Lyle, the big thing is, and we've raised it before, is to make sure that once um, something has finished the construction phase, that it transfers onto our main insurance register. And, uh, you know, there's been precedents around uh, local bodies where that hasn't happened, and the um, yeah, Christchurch was an example of that, where the transfer didn't happen. So through you, Chair, if you're happy, I'll just continue on another couple of items that are in the agenda yes. summary on page 15. Yep. <laughs> so uh, one of the items, thank you, sorry, uh, one of the items is uh, that the risk and compliance team has taken ownership of the fraud policy, uh, the fraud policy as proposed uh, for the committee to recommend the council is attached to the agenda item. Um, and also to note uh, that the um, internal assurance lead has completed an audit of the direct appointment of suppliers. Um, that will be reported back to the uh, committee um, at the next meeting. Good. Um, just one further summary, sorry, just to note, um, and it's connected to some of the other act activities in here, um, and that's around the functions of the procurement manager. So we are in the process of uh, uh, going back out to market to seek to recruit a procurement manager. In the interim, I've taken on some activities in that space. Um, and that's included implementing an advisory service. So we have an advisory service now um, where uh, members of staff can raise questions around the requirements for procurement. Um, and that is across the whole of the procurement life cycle. Um, so that was implemented at the back end of 2023. And um, my feedback today has been that that's been really useful for staff. Um, Mr. Chair, there's a question for you. Yes. On that, the I don't know if it's appropriate, but is it um, the job description for that procurement manager? Is that I don't know, not, want to see all job descriptions? Is that appropriate for the? Uh, uh, can we have a see that job description? See what so we get understanding exactly what the role is. Was that appropriate? I don't know. It's appropriate at all. Got an objection? I don't. No idea. It's just a new position. It's quite a new position. Think you're applying? <laughs> 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 I need, I need another job. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah. one other question going back to the audit of the direct appointment of suppliers. Uh, I was wondering how does it fit in? I noticed we're coming to the agenda later on uh, where we've got uh, relationships with, uh, we put funding into groups like under climate 
management uh, groups like Y Wanaka and Wastebusters and that we we actually are funding providing funding for them to do an activity. Uh, so I don't have got a, like a direct appointment or a formal engagement. I just understand how that fits into here uh, into these direct appointment type things. Does that fit in there at all? It's a good question, um, and it wasn't in the scope of the audit that's been completed recently. Um, there are a number of different processes that um, relate to that type of award of grants. I'm not overly familiar with those, but it, it wasn't a procurement activity in the sense of um, procurement forms and procurement planning that we would do through a standard procurement process, so it wouldn't have been in scope for okay. uh, the audit that we've completed recently. So you, Mr. Mr. Chair, I think the, the difference is that we often make grants to a number of groups. If they then um, form a service relationship with us, that would be through a normal procurement basis. So there's a grant for an organisation, um, but if they then want to tender to do something, that would just go through a normal procurement process. Okay. Is that in the case of something under climate action where they are fulfilling an action that's part of our policy? Does that sort of blur the line between a, a grant for something that an organisation wants to do versus giving money to an organisation that's fulfilling a service that we have committed to providing? Does that become more like a procurement? Um, I, th I think you'd, you'd have to. You know, I suppose you'd have to look whether they were uh, they were basically you know being an advocate or providing some sort of general sort of input into the community, but where they were moving into a specific deliverable and a specific set of deliverables, that's when we would seek to ensure that they follow the normal procurement process. Mm, I think maybe we need to have that. It's a pretty clear distinction between those that we're contracting and those that we're granting granting funds to. Um, there are some that are a little blurred, yeah. but as soon as we're signing a contract, obviously they become a more of a supplier than they are yeah. It'd just be good to make sure that everybody's clear on the distinction and where things get blurry. And, and the internal assurance need, sorry, through you, Chair, the internal assurance need, um, that's a very clear approach in terms of defining what is procurement for the purpose of direct appointment. So um, when he undertook that review, he would have been crystal clear as to whether those types of activities that he would have seen in Tech One, which is our financial system, were part of a direct appointment of supplier or were part of a grant process that isn't a procurement activity. I guess my question is, does everybody in the organisation who's procuring things, do they understand what the insurance, what the people to provide insurance seizes that definition? I think there are a few words. And I guess the point is we want to protect staff and not have them doing things unwittingly that, you know, are crossing the line um, and being called out on it. It would be better to make sure we proactively ensure that they understand where that line is. Through you, Mr Chair, there are, there are a couple of um, parts of the organisation that deal with grants and they have their own processes and, and procedures in terms of allocating funds. So I think they're quite clear, they'd be quite clear about what the accountability is in those, in those situations. And if we are straying into a contract of service, I think um, they'd be well aware of that. Yeah, I, I've just seen parts of, sorry, carry on, I've seen parts of the organisation that are just starting to do a bit more of this, probably strategy and policy via climate. There's a few more, and I don't know what the situation is, but I just, yeah. And lower raising the reasonable question. I'm just going to make sure that that um, goes through the normal process, that those that are charged in that area. Through the chair, by representing the climate action, like you said, we, we do have a note on this for now. Before we, I, I just address your question now, council, or bring it up and during our uh, session and our report. So. Thanks. Thanks. I think, so, sorry to extend the conversation even further, Mr. Chair, but I think, I think we are conscious because we also have um, council also wanting us to find ways to empower local, local community groups and all sorts of things. So there is a tension with council wanting us to get alongside community groups and empower them, but also making sure from a procurement point of view that we're not, we're, we're not sort of basically inadvertently procuring them uh, in, a, in a sort of a, a non-transparent way. So I think the question that 
that uh, Councillor Potts raised as, as relevant um, and one thing I think we're very, we are conscious of. Yeah, thank you. So is that Gareth? Is that that is the end of the executive summary? Happy to okay. take any questions. Yeah, thank you. Questions. I have a few, <laughs> but I thought I'd wait till everyone else had a turn and then I can cross things off my list if they're complicated. Okay, any questions other than from Nikki? Well, I asked my question. Yep. Okay. Um Thank you. Through the chair, um, first one would just be around the insurance strategy and versus the policy renewal time frame. It looks like that policy renewal time frame is coming up quite soon, and that the insurance strategy might not cross the desk of councillors. And I'm just wondering whether that's going to happen. I, there's a questionnaire around risk appetite that probably sits at a governance level. Um, to speak to that one. I suppose in terms of, uh, sorry, through you, Chair, um, in terms of setting a strategy for insurance, um, it is difficult to set that strategy before you understand um, where the market sits from a, um, a premiums perspective. Um, we work uh, very closely, obviously, with uh, Stuart CFO in terms of understanding um, what the premiums might look like and what our response might be um, from a value for money based on risk perspective. Um, I get your point, but it is very difficult. I'm, I'm sorry for us to do a review much earlier than we're currently doing. In this particular year or ever? Um, good question. I'm not sure I can answer that for previous years, um, but the two previous years that I've been involved with, um, getting that information from London, for example, uh, is very difficult to get early enough right. for us to have, say, six months of time to respond to potential premium updates. So do you think that our risk policy and when we go through risk appetite in that framework, is that going to sort of sufficiently inform an insurance strategy so that you can, I guess the point is how to councillors and the risk appetite of councillors, how does that inform your decision around policy, insurance policy decisions? Again, through you, Chair, um, obviously that risk appetite is really critical for that decision-making process. Our existing risk management policy uh, provides some guidance and direction in terms of decision-making in that space as well. Mm. So our, our approach is consistent with the existing policy. Yeah, I guess for me, there's just some concern because we are struggling with rates increases and obviously, you know, the more insurance we pay, the, the higher the rates go. And at the same time, we have a CAPEX issue. We don't have a lot of headroom if something does go wrong. And so there's that, that it's quite a critical balancing act. And I'm just concerned that councillors understand the decisions that are being made um, and have an opportunity to mitigate the risks. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, we're all working in markets that are firming, and as asset values increase, that um, the discussion then around what risk the organisation is prepared to take on is against full insurance, and you know it's being discussed around many board tables with the upcoming renewal, Nikki. So it's the same thing. So until yeah. you know what the appetite is, and especially if you're dealing in the London market, it's one that you've just got to run with and it doesn't give a lot of time, unfortunately. How do boards deal with it, Stuart? Do they, um, are they in control of that or, or is it something that they, they delegate and cross fingers and hope for the best? No, 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 it's uh, definitely uh, managed. Um, but as Gareth said, until they know the pricing, uh, it, there's very little you can do in terms of um, your, around your policy of risk appetite because uh, it could change. And I'll give an example. Uh, there are many listed uh, companies that have large insurance risk in Wellington and suddenly there's no cover. Yeah, so I guess my, my point around that is who, who is going to be involved in making the decisions then knowing understanding that context who because obviously 
at this point we're looking at councillors not being involved in that decision making. Um, um, you know, that's a bit that concerns me. Would a board are we not flexible enough as as local government to to do that in terms of timeframes? I think through you, Mr. Chair, that um, we've taken a relatively conservative view in terms of insurance in the past. So if we were to if we were seeing pricing that we felt we needed to pivot from that a little, we'd certainly reporting be reporting that back in some fashion because that is a a change in our normal um, operations. Um, but as as Gareth has alluded to, the time frame around that's not particularly generous. Okay, well, there are occasionally things that happen that have tight time frames. I'm just wondering if we could deal with it by email. So that I just think we need to have some understanding of where the organisation's going and not be blind to it. Um, we're, we're well aware of making sure we get value for money, but there are also risks that need to be weighed up in that process. So I understand where you're coming from, but traditionally you know, we've maintained a relatively conservative position, but we can inform you. That would be great, because it would just help with LTP decisions and how much you room I'm interested in. I've got some more bit of leases, but I hand up. Um, thank you. Through the chair, Stuart, if I may, while we're on insurance, I was just curious, um, is there any appetite, um, thanks Gareth for your presentation on nodes the other day, is there any precedent or conversation around exploring insurance where there's nodes at risk rather than asset um, individual? Could you speak to sort of that emerging node thinking? Uh, through you, Chair. Again, a very, a very good question. Um, probably not a, a very simple answer, so I'll try. Happy to take any follow-up questions. Um, so the way that our insurance is structured, and I've not seen, I've not necessarily considered it as a node approach, but we do look at the different types of asset that we have, and we make a risk decision. Um, as Stuart said, we're fairly conservative in that regard, but we do treat asset types differently and. I suppose broadly, that is very similar to a node model that we presented the other day, but I've not seen it that way before, but it's a good point and a good yeah. question. Thank Through you, you Mr. Chair, in, in terms yes. of our dialogue with the London insurers in particular, we have um, presented to them in the past some loss modelling in terms of various types of events and how that might impact our infrastructure because we're not a large urban um, centre. So, um, down to the down to the uh, level of detail in terms of if, if a particular fault were to rupture, these these this infrastructure might be impacted, but others may not. So that information given to the underwriters in London helps them when they're assessing our risk and our premium. So that is in play already. We've certainly provided that information over the last five years. Great. So the more we flesh out that background on the node. Absolutely. The more we can it's good information in terms of assessing risk at the yeah. underwrite level. That was really interesting the other day, too. Thank you, Greg, for that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, through the chair, uh, Stuart. Um, Stuart, how much are we paying the young <laughs> It would be, and I'm off the top of my head here, uh, it's probably four, $4 million in total, is it? Four, four to five? You've got that in your budget. Insurance premiums? Uh, yeah, all out, it's about one point four. And that's coming through the delegation of council because you might. Um, I think uh, Stuart will make a comment on this, but I think in terms of standard practice, um, where there's a significant change in approach to ensure requirement, then it's a paper, I think, um, council noting potential change and risks that goes with it. Mm. I know that a lot of what we've spoken, family entities and public sector are actually making quite significant. Shifts, shifts. Yeah. And really looking at asset portfolios and saying, are uh, we in effect prepared to increase that excess because the risk of anything is quite low? So, those sort of decisions and trade offs being made around board tables. Yeah. Current budget's 2.6. 2.6. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the point that you've raised, um, Bill, is, you know, and to Stu's point, if we see ourselves. Um, contemplating a significant shift in our stance, then that's a conversation we do need to have with our governments. Because it could well be that um, we now choose spend doesn't change, but what you're sure it does, covering it does. it's important that council knows where there may be risk through, in fact, having a greater 
Rex's is off to classes. Yeah. But, yeah. But, that, that's exactly what's happening. Also, the, the future debates around insurance will be availability. So we've been in a situation where insurance has been able to be got and placed, but um, you know, you take places like California and Japan, uh, where you you can't get full insurance, and they've adapted to that, and that's where we're heading because the pool of money for this part of the world is decreasing, and asset values are increasing. So they will be the sort of discussions that um, councils, uh, directors, and community groups will be having in the future. And especially if we get another major event. I think um, just as a last comment from me on this, it would be useful um, given the local government to sort of set out the options that were considered and the pros and cons and the reporting around the decisions that are made and making it really clear for everyone how how we came to the decision we did or how staff came to the decision they did. Is that possible? Well, I just, I'm just saying it's, you know, the local government community do have to consider the options and we have to weigh them up and it would be helpful if that was set down somewhere as to how we work through that. Well, I think, I think as, as Stu said, we've got an established management regime for insurance. We're not at this point seeking to depart from that. If we're going to depart from that significantly as Bill's idea to buy, then yes, we would, we would come to council and, and sort of um, have that. So, but we're, I don't think we're going to go back and uh, I don't, I'm not intending that we go back and uh, basically review what is a very well established um, insurance process. Yeah, know, yeah, I'm just saying, how do we know that's still fit for purpose? Like, how do we, surely there's a process of going through and saying, given in the current context, is this still fit for purpose? And what are the other options rather than just sticking with this? Sound? Well, that, that, that'll be a signal, that would be a signal from the market, and you're not getting that at the stage, you. That's great. Okay. Let me see what pops out of it. Um, I've got a couple of other issues that we'll cover on this. Um, just on the compliance policy pathway, um, I just wanted to signal that it would be useful to have another workshop. It was quite high level, the workshop that we had the other day. And so before it comes to us, I'd quite like to make sure that you know councillors have been able to give feedback on on risk appetite and that we've sort of understood it a bit more. It's this is the first time it's come to councillors and I think there's more work to be done before it is approved or more feedback to come from councillors to staff. This personal opinion um, on that one. Um, and the other one just with the compliance policy, will it include a pathway um, for resolving concerns um, that councillors have around organisational compliance. So would the policy include in it a specific, so councillors could go, look, I've got an issue, here's the process that I follow if I think there's been a compliance issue on something. So uh, through you, Chair, um, the compliance policy, as I said at the workshop earlier on this week, we are in very early stages of, of developing the compliance policy. Yeah. Um, my initial view would be is that outlines the mandatory requirements in terms of systems and management of uh, compliance with legislation and internal policies um, and also our voluntary obligations. I think what you're talking about probably sits outside um, the policy itself, um, but I'm happy to consider that as we go through the process. And to your question earlier, I'm, I'm happy to re-workshop and if necessary, the compliance management framework, we're very much at the early stages. So what I presented was our initial overview of what we think needs to be incorporated into that policy. Okay, and the yeah, second workshop would be really helpful. And I really would, um, I suppose I can bring it up at the workshop, but I think it would be helpful for councils to have some sort of pathway. Otherwise, you can raise an issue and it just comes up against my opinion is I disagree with you. And I think there needs to be an avenue for um further investigation of concerns. Um, yes, could you know those? I think you're all right. Thanks, Alex. Um, and the last one I had was just a, um, on the fraud policy, and I sent an email around um, to everybody. It's just a concern with what gets captured, um, and I doesn't 
look like there's any intention to capture it, but I think it is. So if information is disclosed to any third party, which may be a councillor, an elected member, disclosing something to the media, which, you know, and there are rules around that in the code of conduct. My issue is that it is not necessarily fraud and we shouldn't be defining as fraud something that is not fraud. Um, so I've sent a little bit interesting. Nick, yeah. Oh, yeah, I didn't read it that way. I read it that um, it was divulging information around maybe uh, contract information, um, that sort of tenure rather than speaking to the media. Well, it, it, I guess my point is that, if, it, this is how it reads, fraudulent behaviour includes but is not limited to disclosing confidential or proprietorial information to third parties, and then below that, any of the above for personal gratification and or edification, whether or not there is pecuniary gain. And so technically, I think disclosing something to the media is captured. Well, it's um, confidential or uh, proprietary for information, yeah, definitely. So, it so it's captured. So the question is, is that fraud? And should it be dealt with under this policy? Or are there other avenues, Code of Conduct, um, Ombudsman Act, Lagoima, um, that are more appropriate for dealing with that? Um, there, you know, there are a number of times when Council has not released information and then a decision of the Ombudsman has said it should have been released. Those decisions can be a year and a half later, in my experience. Um, and so if something was disclosed because there was a time, you know, a timing issue, and um, and this is all hypothetical, obviously, um, but I can see that causing an issue and having been um, at the end of a code of conduct, and I knew that was going to happen, to have called it fraud and to have fraud stick with you for the rest of your days because you're trying to do the right thing by the community, I think, um, would be unfair, and I think it would detract from, you know, attempts to be transparent and and meet the purpose of the Local Government Act, and I would hate to see us decide to do that. Um, so I don't know what the solution is, whether it's writing in a specific exemption or, um, or whether the wording as it is could be amended. I'm um, open to ideas, but um, I can't agree it as it is because I can see this happening. With the chair, sure. Yes. I, I don't agree with you, Nikki. I mean, uh, the paragraph that there was the definition of fraud is quite clear in terms of the context of the behaviour that follows. You can't read the behaviour before you read the definition of fraud. Fraud is very clear. This is a standard policy. So you don't think it is captured because there's a difference between whether, whether it's captured and that's okay and whether it's not captured. It's really clear. The definition of fraud is basically in this policy fraud includes all acts of deception, corruption, misrepresentation, or omission committed with the intention of gaining an unjust or legal financial advantage okay. or to cause an unjust or legal loss or disadvantage. It's really clear. So the behaviours afterwards, you think That's you, you think can... that they they come set they're secondary to the paragraph above and releasing information. Well, no, the paragraph about about defines what fraud is. And then how you actually perpetrate for to be one of those behaviours on the standard. Okay, so so it's not captured in your mind. Well, it, it's not all encompassing. Yeah, okay. it, it's, it's the definition is already clear and explicit, and that's how you could assess the behaviours against that definition. Lisa, yeah. Thank you, if I may, um, through the chair, and I agree with Bill. I think the first line um, states. A very high bar for anyone to have to have crossed to start with. It has to have been intentional, has to have involved the use of deception, and it has to have been to obtain unjust or illegal advantage. So simply going to the media to express personal opinion as an elected member, um, if you're going out there using deception to obtain unjust advantage, um, I agree the definition of fraud is a very high bar to cross, um, but it's stated clearly, and I think elect this, the scope of this was extended to include elected members, contractors, volunteers. Um, I think we should all be held to the same um, standard, and in my opinion, information is an asset, 
data is the new oil. There can be proprietary interests, um, but also the risk of personal harm um, or of things. And I, I take Councillor Glennon's point around um, the concern around timeliness of information. However, there are reasons why Lagoim is a thoroughly investigated. Any organisation deserves the right to um, protect privacy. And, and I note if you're waiting on an outcome, for example, of a coroner's report, it could take two or three years to determine the, um, the appropriate information and investigation. The policy outline clearly um, provides for, <coughs> excuse me, prevention of fraud. Um, so elected members would be um, briefed, trained, um, clear expectations would be set. Um, people now think the code of conduct, while um, appropriate in defining some of our behaviours has been a blunt tool to manage councillor behaviour in the past across the country. Um, and it's important that we, we really define um, our fraud policy in this way. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Yeah, um, he's yeah, there he's... as well. Um, Mr. Chair, do you um, just like to make a comment there? Um, uh, Lisa and Bill, I do agree with um, what you're saying there around the definition of fraud in that first paragraph. I do personally think there is that second to last bullet point is contrary to that definition above. Um, fraud, in my mind, and in the definition, I think, comes back to pecuniary gain. And when you're then bullet pointing behaviour saying that that's a kind of irrelevant. I, I think that's contrary. That's just my opinion. Um, can I suggest that unjust advantage doesn't necessarily just refer financial? This, I believe, protects elected members from each other um, when there may be different agendas running leading up to campaigns or other um, scenarios that um, you know we just all need to be certain that we're not acting using deception to obtain unjust and illegal advantage um, regardless of where we sit in the organisation. And I do believe there's still mechanisms for um, elected members to interact with um, third parties and you're talking about the media here um, very openly um, without it straying into the area of fraud. So with respect, if we're talking about fraud and fraud policy, I would think that sort of behaviour that falls outside the pure definition of fraud. Just to, to, to follow on from that, I mean, the, the release of confidential or proprietary information, and um, coming back to council, guide, is an action of fraud. Um, yeah, and yeah. and I think, no, well, I think it, it falls within the definition of, of, you know, yes, it can be, but I don't think nothing actually empowers an individual councillor to release material that the council as a whole has decided remains confidential. That, that, that is very clear. That has to be very clear. That is a decision of the council. If through other processes, and some, I think like someone mentioned the local government, the local Wimmer Act, if that ultimately determines that something should be made about, that's due process, and that's a process that's there. I don't think we shouldn't be uh, enabling or countenancing the right of any individual person to take a decision that the council has made and said, I've got a decision that I think that that should be made available to a third party. No, so I totally agree with you on that, Mike, as well, but I think there's other, other methods of dealing with it than calling it a fraud. Are you talking about the second bullet point or the second to last bullet point? Second to last. Second to last. So this is not about yeah. confidential information. This is second to last bullet point. This, is a, this, is, this is, goes down to the reason for it, and it's subjective. So an accusation can be made that something was done for personal gratification and or edification for political purposes when it may have been done in the public interest of an elected member acting in the public interest. No pecuniary gain in full knowledge that you will have a code of conduct breach against you and that that will be sitting on your social media for anyone to search in the future. But you do it because you believe it's the right thing for your community and you believe the organisation may be withholding information that they shouldn't be withholding. Um, and you take that step, and, and I, have, I have had, I've been mentored, and I, and I have been told, look, you weigh these things up when you're an elected member, because you're in a position where you're there to represent the community, and the organisation sometimes does things and emits information to protect itself. 
um, we have to look at the Local Government Act and the requirement to be accountable and for things to be transparent. And how does this cut against that? And are there other ways of dealing with the release of information? We already have a code of conduct. There are mechanisms, I believe, under the Ombudsman Act or the Liberal Wimba where complaints can be made if information has been released. But then it would be released to, and the, the decision will be made by an organisation that would also look at whether the information should have been withheld in the first place. And that's appropriate. Calling it fraud is completely unfair and inappropriate. And I think if there's any chance, and it sounds like it is intended to be captured because the Chief Executive has, has spoken along those lines, um, then I think we need to amend it um, to be sure that it doesn't capture that. And I don't know how we do that. Maybe we need to take some time to do it. But this is really important because it cuts right to the heart of democracy and 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 what you know as elected members, what we are supposed to be doing. Um, yeah, Lyle, I think you got your yep. hand up. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I disagree. Um, it all comes down to uh, all you're saying. The you know, you said a lot of words, but it comes down to confidential proprietary information uh, shouldn't be released. And you know when you that I you know, I did look at that second last bullet point. And I think we've got to set the bar high. And you can talk about all the other things, you talk about local government and all that. We want to send the message that you don't disclose confidential or private information. Now, every other organisation I've worked in had exactly the same thing. You know? you know, for, for example, you've got it in the central government. I had it in the Navy. Uh, it's, it's got to be a bar set high. And you know, whether you want to call it fraud or not, I think it is. It's and not uh, hang on. And so I disagree with saying and I don't agree with delaying it and doing more work on it. We've got a thing in place. Okay, the second last bullet point is a bit questionable, but uh, it does refer to all the above. And then but the second point is the most crucial one, disclosing confidential private information to third parties. It shouldn't happen. Um, and so just for the record, Jerry was clear. Um Although I think that that second to last bullet point is somewhat contrary um, to the definition of fraud, I don't in any way agree with the fact that a, a councillor should take on their own efforts to disclose confidential information that has been determined confidential by the council. So I just want to make that clear, but I think there are different places to deal with that, being the code of conduct. Yeah. 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 Okay, any other comments? Thoughts? If not, we've got a, a resolution required to note the contents of this report and recommend to council that it adopts the proposed fraud policy. I'll move, Mr. Chairman. I'll okay. second, Mr. Chair. Second. Okay. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Carry. Thank you. Oh, um, hang on, hang on. Against. <laughs> Yeah, no, I was just going to ask you, Nikki, do you want your <laughs> vote recorded? I'm approved that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It was a good, robust discussion. Thank you, Commissioner. Right, moving next to the financial overview, we've got Paddy and we've got Jeremy. We've just got Paddy, by the way. Yeah. Just Paddy. That's enough. Uh, morning to the chair and to yeah. the committee. Um, so the first paper we have today is the December financial year-to-date overview. Um, this contains an update on our net office and capex and balance sheet position. Just taking the paper as read, and it is for noting, um, we'll just take the opportunity to highlight the following key messages. So with the net office position, we do have a 5.4 million adverse variance, um, and that's because we are experiencing cost pressures across our operating expenditure line items. Uh, two key contributors to this variance includes the $1.6 million cost from the September weather event, and also $1.4 million additional costs within interest due to the higher interest rates. Um, Finance team is currently working through this position, and uh, for the next committee meeting, we'll have an update on our forecast for the remainder of the year. Uh, and the second key message just to highlight is within CAPEX, the paper does include our specific commentary by project briefings um, with our latest CAPEX projections, now forecasting a $893.5 million CAPEX spend for the year. So happy to take any questions with that. 
Yeah, just I've got one, Patty. Just with the change of focus with the new government, with the NZTA spending, have we got anything in our budgets that we thought would um, we've received that may be doubtful now? Um, no, it's probably not. Okay, not not on um, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, we are reviewing um, our, particularly our um, draft 10 year plan budgets with the change in direction, um, particularly in the transport area, to yes. identify any projects that we previously assumed we would be getting funding for that we may not now. So that's part of a, a, the ongoing work in terms of finalising us the um, capex for the LTP. I'm not aware of any in the current year. Okay, thank you. We, sorry, we, we have had one instance where um, there was a project that was underway where NZTA um, asked councils that were involved in those projects to look at any budget savings. Um, so we have gone through that exercise, but there's nothing where our program, Tony, um, where we've been, had money pulled as a result of those changes. It's much more looking forward into the next 10-year um, plan. Yes. Okay. So there may be some projects that we've got in there that still need to have the funding to be further out, which would need to go to the RTP process as well. Nikki. Um, thank you. Um, just a question around um, capital expenditure reporting. I'm just wondering if it would be helpful for other members and if it would be possible if we could understand a sort of percentage year-to-date completion against year-to-date spend. Because as you've said in there, sometimes things, it's hard to tell whether something is a timing issue or whether something's gone over and whether, I guess, looking at did we forecast budgets completely and or are we consistently running over? Um, is that something that is possible or is it? Yeah, so just sort of recording our physical completion as we are with the, with the finance. So we can see if something's gone, you know, 105% over you today, but you're only 50% completion. Yeah, um, something we probably look at. We've got 380 odd projects in yeah. there, so it'd be quite a big exercise to do. Um, talk to the PMO to sort of see if they have anything like that. Maybe start. it's just for certain categories or I'm open to what other It's a higher level though, isn't it? We've got a higher level in the year today reporting that we were doing in terms of capex. Yeah, at, at the high level, is, are you asking for at, at by project level? Or? Yeah, well just as, as you've reported it through the report, it would be useful. I know that the appendices at the end do have some sort of high level, it's usually percentage of spend though, isn't it? Not percentage of yeah, percentage complete, yeah, it's percentage yeah. expenditure. So I'm, we're just wanting to understand practical completion percentage against percentage expenditure so that we can understand whether things are running under or running over. And, and it might help the organisation as well to sort of... Yeah, so I guess from a governor's point of view, taking Stu's mm -hmm. point, we can ask the officers just to sort of note anything that's sort of in the is it outer range. Is it where it's supposed to be? Yeah. We do have percentage of budget year to date and percentage of total year budget uh, reported already in those schedules. Yeah, that's what I was questioning. You, you're not happy with, like, for example, South Africa country year to date budget 0. 0.2 million, actuals 0. 0.3, full year budget 0. 0.5. So you get a feel how it's going. We've got that for all the uh, big projects anyway in this report. But Is that what you're not talking no, about? No, but practical completion, you don't understand. So, um, and through that. So, you can look at you know, this was the year budget and how you're going against the budget, but how much have you actually done? So think about the arterial and we're well over and and yet we're way behind in terms of what's practically completed on the ground. Um, so I think you'll be very careful because practical completion and percentage spent don't necessarily run together. We don't, you know, uh, at, at times you may front load all your expenditure and so you have to spend a lot. Well, roading renewals is a classic example. Uh, very little being spent in the first part. The heat being spent right now, all the going and things. So six million, I think it says in here. And we're we way behind, but in this next period, that's so that that's a classic example where you can't. It's not a smooth road. Yeah. I guess from this we can't want a smooth road though. Can't anticipate where they're going to yeah, the runs. Yeah. That's the thing. Whereas if we if we could report against, you know. Are we spending more but not doing as much? Because generally that's what we're doing. We spend an awful lot, but we don't actually get. Yeah, I, I think that's, sorry, I think that's a little unfair. Yeah. Yeah, Nikki, I think what would be... Oh, sorry, Lisa, you go first. 
Oh, with, uh, not to interrupt you, Chair. <laughs> no, no, you go. Yep. I um, had a question around, probably following on from where Lau came from. Um, it's it's great to see so much work just being achieved. My question is, there's a lot there to happen in our construction season pre-May um, from the PMO office. Um, are we confident in the market's ability to deliver um, what's in there um, in this time frame? That's all actually scheduled and... Yeah, yeah, we do have the next six months of spend, so we've got 115 mil coming up. Um, it's reasonably robust there with the Alliance um, and the PMO, their forecast seems to be pretty within a tight range, so confident there. Yeah, and just uh, with the renewals as well, obviously that's just an annual budget. So yeah, and I did have one other question around the shot over treatment plant, um, and it's probably a bit high level. I'd just like to understand how our risk around that sits also with OIC's risk management. I know they're concerned around the power and and you know, what's happening at shot over. Um, could you speak to that? How do we um, coordinate with our yeah. regional council. Really, Mr. Chair, it's probably outside of Paddy's. Um, Sorry. Name, but Tony may be able to come <laughs> in. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Thank you. So, uh, the OIC is aware of that. You're talking about non compliance, current non compliance with the shot of Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, the OIC is aware of that. We're picking up a, a big bit of work looking at the non compliance and how we deal with that. So, the discussions with um, the OIC, there is a significant risk there that's likely to incur greater capital costs to deal with uh, current non compliance. Uh, that was in the current LTV, we would fund budget for that, which is kicking that process on. So we know it's a known risk, uh, but there's pressure on and then put on to try and work through what the options are for us on that front. So that would sit across both organisations' risk registers to address in some sort of collaborative um, way? How does that die I don't know. No. I don't think the OIC would be see it being fixed in a collaborative manner. I've got a regulatory function. Uh, the, the, the risk is with us in terms of our, our ways of the treatment plan and how we operate and what we need to do. Uh, they're sitting there as a regulator rather than a participant in terms of managing that. Would be my sort of think about that. Okay, thank you for the explanation. Uh, it's a discharge, sort of discharge in the way that it, yeah, but currently uh, the system is, is not performing as designed, so we're getting discharges into the outside of, the, of its current continuum. So, so, yeah, so we're managing that, trying to work that through. So I was using word there, and um, it's a significant issue for us. Um, at the same time, we're also obviously upgrading the capacity of show. So there's a large bit of work going on at the moment. Um, um, and the smell, the odour is, is it's sort of under control now, much better than what it was. But there's ongoing issues around that as well. Uh, through the chair, Stuart. Um, yes. I have a little bit of sympathy for Council Gaining's comments. Um, paragraph 30 of the report, which is the PMO commentary, what could be helpful, Patty, is uh, on future reports, gives the statement about the percent of user day spent um, against the you know the forecast spent this first uh, half of the year and where it'll be in terms of full year budget. Um, so I think it'd be useful for them to make a statement about on and off track. Um, yeah, yeah quite explicit. Um, so that you get a bit of sentiment. Mean, there's a lot of information that follows, but actually having a paragraph which says uh, all our projects are on track. Uh, there are no significant risks around. Days or cost overruns would be really important because then there's a the point of accountability in terms of project management office actually raising stuff up through the water committee through the council if there are. So, the key thing you don't want to do is the councils be surprised. Yeah. So, so, I think having a paragraph in there, which they complete each time for you, is I think we'll sort of round it out. Yeah. Yeah. Bill, I was going to go a wee bit further, just answering Nikki, is that if there are two or three or four or five projects that are at risk, uh, there should be a wee bit of commentary, just a summary of at-risk projects. Yeah, and we do have a bit of that through the um, quarterly reports, I think, don't we? At the end of the section, we have some projects and we have some sort of red, orange, green kind of stuff. That kind of thing would be yes. really helpful. Yeah. It's just about to say a traffic light system of some point, but easily yep. I think yeah. that could be added to Schedule B um, because the breakdown of the commentary is much fuller in that in that, in that appendix. And we could add 
of some kind with uh, traffic lights. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Any? Oh, sorry. Oh, you go um, Thank you through, through your chair. Um, just a couple of questions regarding this too. So, debtors analysis, this was always a, always a hot topic, I suppose. We've seen quite a big rates increase last year. We are seeing them sort of slide out a little bit. Um, obviously, that's probably going to get worse in the coming year. Um, what we are sort of seeing is more and more and more pressure coming into the personal and the commercial sectors. Um, so, I guess just something to keep on radar, right? Yes, I don't know how you manage it better than we currently are. Um, and just, I guess, a question if you've got a comment, have you guys started work on the LTP and it's been deferred a little bit, but um, just here looking at debt ceilings and, you know, is there any discussions internally of, you know, reduction of level of service or anything like that? Or, you know, how, how do we actually get some austerity measures in place to try to work within some, some thresholds, you know? Don't have to if you haven't got the answer. I, I understand, but I mean, is that something that I'm not guessing that's a full piece going into the LTC already? Through you, Mr. Chair, I'll just point the committee to paragraph 59. That does point to the current state, I suppose, of um, ratepayer debt. And we have seen, um, as many other sectors, that the collectability of, of uh, uh, debts is, is more difficult. Obviously, there's a bit, bit of quite a bit of household stress and business stress in the market at the moment. We've seen a lift in terms of the number of properties that are in arrears. And so it went from 3% of rental properties last this time last year, 2.6 million, and that's moved to 3.5% th at 3.5. So um, 3.4. So that we are seeing more that being more prevalent, and we're working through payment plans for more rate payers um, um, in order to get them back uh, on track. So that's, that's definitely something that the team are working through. Um, that's the first, yeah. the first part. Are there any... Yes, Stu, yes, Stu, just a comment on that. Um, there's 200 billion of house mortgages resetting as we speak, between, um, between now and the end of the year. So I believe in 2024, you're going to see a lot more stress in under 25. I agree. Yeah. And the, the, yeah. And the thing is, it's, it seems to be impacting households. So 46% of those in arrears were residential. Um, so I just that's wonder... In, that's in proportion to the number of residential. There were none, no commercials in arrears, though, were there? Yeah, it was visitor accommodation, but it said... That was just a major group. Oh, okay, yeah. there'll be a few. Yeah. I'm just wondering a bit. Um, just wondering what the long through the chair, because this, um, we are working with the finance team, um, I'm talking about the organisation performance team, we're currently working on a project charter for a, um, a debt management framework. So um, that will include a review of debt collection processes, etc. So I think this is very much uh, a piece of work that we, we do have a uh, spotlight on right now. Mm, I guess the thing is we're going to continue to run over. Maybe the payments plans will work. But if, if we're looking at, say, doubling debt, um, doubling rates in, in six years, um, how is that going to impact that number? Is it is it affordable? Because there's practical implications for us. So one are we looking at, as he says, cutting down wherever we can. Um, and two, are we looking at who who should be paying, who can afford to pay? And I, I'm just interested in some of the differentials around um, commercial and visitor accommodation and whether that's a way um, to put some of the burden on to back onto visitors in lieu of a visitor levy. Well, they're, they're all, through you, Mr Chair, they're all questions that the council will need to determine through the, through the LTP. But well, I can tell you it's a very difficult balancing act um, for this LTP. Mm -hmm. Having assumed the responsibility of the three waters, there is the three waters. There's a lot yeah. of expenditure that's required, and the cost of doing that work has escalated significantly in the past five years. So the pressure is going to be on. And there is only one primary source of income for most councils, and that's rates. So the pressure will be on rates. 
And, and, and in order to manage that debt, the debt side, we have to have strong revenue streams. So it's it's something that we signaled uh, you know, three years ago that we didn't get a visitor levy and we retained three waters rates increases would be significant. And that's going to come to pass. Given that, because three waters is a given, it has to be done, but there are other things that don't have to be done. Um, will the councillors have options, option scenarios in front of them? Here is your austerity budget and, and rates impact. And here is your, with the things we would like to do, maintaining level of service, because I think, as he said, that, that option needs to be in front of us in the community. We need to understand but, what it looks like, you know, without certain things that we can do without. Probably not a no, it's not, but it's whether it's the risk of not giving councillors the option, it's the risk of poor decision making. If the staff don't provide councillors with the options, if they don't do that work behind the scenes and present them to us, then it's very difficult to say no to what is presented. We I'm sure to... that will very much be on the agenda. I hope so. <laughs> Has it been so far? Well, suppose the chair, I mean, for the long term planning process, um, given the fact that three waters has come back in. Um, there'll be a range of protected choices that will go to consultation in terms of priorities for the next 10 years based on um, you know known revenue versus rating increases. And so there will force a discussion about what are the priorities, what's core plus what's strategic. That's right, and that's how we've divided the work yes. um, in terms of what we've called our baseline and obviously what the three waters came back and has really been. Uh, I probably disagree with Council Glenn that it hasn't been discussed. Council at times over the last uh, nine months have raised uh, various things that they either wanted to raise or not raise, whether that's fees, whether that's activities. And Council Glenn has raised that a couple of times. So that's not quite what I'm meaning. And so, yes, we have had discussions. I guess my point is you put together a package. There's, there's levers you can pull in, in the computer and you can do, we're pulling this in and we're pulling this out and it comes out and it says, this is what your rates will be. And you have to have that package in front of you because, it, so I think, you know, setting a strategic direction to say, well, look, we'd like to consider an austerity budget, a low rates budget, keeping the baseline stuff, but taking out everything that doesn't meet that baseline and potentially reducing levels of service, but we can't see the ultimate effect of those things and it's put together as a package. We're just tinkering around the edges going, we don't want the council building or we don't want this, but it's about building those big picture options for us. Um, and that's what hasn't been done. That's great. Yeah, there's no conversation with that. No, it's outside the scope of this report, that's for sure. So that's exactly, I see the process because there's not limitless um, funding available. And as Stu said, uh, we have um, some income streams, we'd like to have others, and that's discussions with government. And if that doesn't happen in the short term, then obviously there's going to be constraints on what can be done. Great. Lyle, yeah. Yeah, I've got a couple of points for just on the risk side of a couple of projects, but just before we go to that, I just got to make once again make the point that uh, if we didn't have three waters, uh, the ratepayers would still be paying for it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, whether they, whoever doesn't matter who's doing it, the ratepayers are still the main source of paying for it, which is something that has to be dealt with. So, we need an alternative funding stream. And that's why I say we should get a share of the GST back, and then I'll move on from that. Um, page, uh, page 38. Uh, might have been more for Tony, but just to, there's a much risk in this project North Monica conveyance. Uh, we've got a, uh, we've got a, we're in the, we were in the court uh, mediation going on, and I was wondering if there's any, any advice or any information on that, that that's a risk to that program that we should be talking about here. I don't know whether in this, in this environment where we need to be talking about it. But just, uh, so we switch page on the uh, Page 38, uh, North, North Wanaka Conveyance, you know, the, the locals there took uh, a penalty or objected to the designation. Paragraph 32. Uh, fourth, fourth yeah, point one, two, fourth point down. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, no, there is still some risk associated with that, given the appeal situation, but we're working through it's still in the appeal situation. My saying is yes, but okay. I would need to confirm that. That's right. 
Thank you. Uh, the other one was just in, down at uh, paragraph 33, the Upper Cooper Conveyance Scheme, it talks about reviewing the overall program. This is the one I understand from how we're using government money. Um, just understanding is there much risk involved with when we're talking about reviewing the overall program. Uh, no, there's no risk. What's happened is, uh, as we get through this, confirming that the pipe size of that is appropriate for okay. Okay. the new population projections that's taken at the moment we'd hoped, but we've uh, just about finalised that and we're really good. Thank you. Uh, Mr Chair, the other one, a couple of points, <laughs> they're really just technical. Uh, hey, paragraph 35 says the act, I'm actually probably about numbers, yeah, the actual date to, to spend uh, 5.7 or 58% of 7.7 .7 or 58 point. 58% of 7.7 is actually 4.4, not 5.7. <laughs> well done. Yeah. And I'm sorry, you go on paragraph 38, you've got 48, it's a wee bit different there too. You've got zero. 0. 0.3 million on se or 77% of a 0. 0.3 million full year budget. Well, that doesn't work out. It's actually 0. 0.2. All right. Just a, yeah. I might be rounding up. Yeah, you're rounding it. It's just a. Are they, um, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lyle. Nikki? Thank you. Um, just a question about um, the Kingston TIFs scheme. Just um, want some clarity around um, who's managing what and how we're managing risk. It, it looks like um, we've got Headleys on behalf of KBL managing procurement, and I'm just interested in um, who's managing the construction phase. Um, are we paying for a construction phase that someone else is managing? And if so, how are we managing the risk? And is it the same scenario for um, wastewater and water supply? Yeah, Tony, I'll give you a on that one. Yeah, so I'm just, so where's the reference, sorry? Oh, sorry. It's very um, nice reference. Oh, okay. So yeah, no, 30, uh, uh, page, page 39 might be yeah. helpful. That's talking about the stormwater, which has this. Ah, okay. So, uh, so Mr. Chair, no, we don't think there's any risk associated with that. So the, the agreement with KBL has the stormwater um, system being designed uh, or constructed by um, KBL. So we're the part of that project team. The water and wastewater is being managed by the council. We're going to have the project manager shortly to manage those. So that's sitting within the council's ember. Okay. Uh, in the stormwater, we are, we're across that. They've also got to do their own stormwater system within their own development, which is solely sitting with them. Okay, so it's just the part that's off their land, on council land. Yeah, and then yes. the agreement around how that has been uh, designed. And so it, is it not a large sum? Like, I mean, I don't, how, what's the... What's the um, rough figures for? Oh, sorry, I don't have that here. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm just interested in you know it's a, it's a tricky thing when, when we're paying for it, but someone else is managing it. Are, is it are we responsible for overruns? That, that's a common mm -hmm. way to live in, in Australia. Yeah. So without oversight, like how we over, no, how no one said it was without oversight. Yeah, so I'm just wondering how we're managing that risk. That's all. So I don't have that, I'm not sure what the question is. Yes. There's an arrangement with KBL around the delivery of the stormwater. I don't have the details about the project you know, management of that. I can find that out and come back to you. I don't have that. Yeah, so just project. to be clear, it's just about when somebody else is managing construction and we're paying for it, how we're having oversight and managing the risk of overruns. Well, so there's that. a project recording structure around that. So I'll come back to the details. Okay, thanks, Tony. Yeah, thank, thank you, Tony. Yep. Subdivisional standards and yeah, there's a lot of standards to be made around that as well. Okay, we're going to keep moving. There's been some good questions, so I'll move that we note the contents of this report. We've got a seconder. Thank you, Heath. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Carrie, thank you. And Patty, you need to stay there. We've got two for sensitive expenditure now. Okay, so the second paper today is the sensitive expenditure. Again, I've taken the paper as read and for noting. Um, one area of the paper I'd like to highlight for this quarter is that finance has completed a transactional reviewable POs under 10K, just to ensure there's been no deliberate splitting of lower spend occurring so I step any um, procurement payment requirements. Still working through this review with a small amount of POs we're still following up with, but at this stage and at the higher level, um, we cannot note any deliberate and correct behaviour. Um, also working with the procurement team with this, just to note if there's any further 
further guidance that is required for staff in this space as well. Um, thank, thank you, Patty. Questions, Nikki? Yes, just one on that. Why do we not have something in place where we can go to the managers and, and we just know because we ask the question? Just given what went down, you know, um, with the CQM thing, which was around the under 10K spend and lumping things together, what has the organisation not after that put something in place where the managers would be tracking us already? I just don't, I don't understand why um, it's difficult to get the information and it's, it's taken, it's it's taken a while. So the, the projects under 10Ks, that was the problem with ZQN, that there were a number of projects lumped together, they were all set at sort of what even it was, I think it was still 10K, 2015. Um, but overall, that was a much, um, it was one of essentially, yeah. and it should have been undertaken through a different procurement method. And oh, so these were the oh. risky area, and so we asked for this at the last meeting, but clearly it's not an easy thing to figure out. No, it's it's, so, uh, it's just a body. So but I would have thought there would have been some sort of something in place that managers would have been directed to manage this. I, it just feels like there's a big gap in our procurement reporting. and. There's nothing that's come back through you, Mr Chair, that suggests there is an issue. No, no, it's not whether it's an issue or not. It's whether we have a reporting regime in place. And I know when councillors agreed the last procurement policy, there was a piece of work that hadn't been done yet around tracking and recording and reporting um, how we were doing in relation to the policy. And it just seems like there's a big gap. And I'm just, I'm just wondering why, because we haven't had the staff, is it? And what and I guess more importantly, maybe, is what are we going to do to make sure all managers track this and manage it so that when, you know, we want to do a report, a report that information is just right there. Yes, yeah, so we have that now. Um, we have to obviously okay. go through the system and design it and work out what we're looking at. So we do have that and I'll get feature the reporting going forward. Um, okay. You know, yep. we stretch. We've got a lot of priorities going on at the yeah. stage as yeah. well, but, you know, we've got a subset of 30 suppliers that we're looking at, you know, so... Um, we are sort of tracking down on it and now it's just going out to the business and just having a chat to find out what is happening. Okay, so to be clear that all the managers now will have our system in place for tracking all of those under 10k spends and whether they're lumped together or okay. so. I think um, in, in terms of your questions around assurance um, it's probably really important to understand where this review fits in. Uh, so excuse me, I, I just want to cover off if it's helpful, our three lines model and then what controls we have, because I think that might answer your question. Um, so our procurement process obviously has an approval requirement um, and um, there are a number of obligations through our procurement policy in terms of various different levels of procurement activity and associated risk. Um, any uh, purchase order or spend that's raised to through the system has to be approved by someone and we've gone through a process of training um, all people across the organisation and the new procurement advisory function has sat down with various teams including managers to remind them of their obligations under the policy. Um, what the finance team have done and I think it's really useful at the request of council is uh, a second line review so a compliance review they've actually gone in and trawled through information in the system to give us assurance that managers are meeting uh, my and your expectations through the procurement policy um, we then as we reported in my paper earlier in risk and compliance have third line assurance that sits across that so direct appointment of suppliers is another set of eyes to make sure that when we are engaging suppliers, certainly if we're direct appointing for the scope of that audit, we are uh, ensuring it's consistent with our policy. Great. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you. Um, quick question through you, Mr Chair, just on the procurement side. If we're referencing the the findings that came out of the ZQN report, for me, it was kind of more important that there was a purchase order that was under 10,000, but the actual spend was 
over 10,000. Mm. Uh, there are the mechanisms now in place that that sort of stuff is being the actual spending budget for those those directors' awards. Is that now in place? Well, yeah. Well, the, yeah, there's financial delegations in the system, so we wouldn't be able to go over that 10 Ks here. Yeah. But what we're looking at now is just the bumping up, I guess, of those, those POs. So they'll be on different POs, but by the supplier, that's, that's above the game. That's what we're looking at. Your specific point there, there is, check one has it, an actual delegation, but we can't go over. If we've had an 8K, we can't go to 12K. So. Okay. So that's, that's an IP constraint as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, check one. Okay, thank you for that. Can I have a mover for the noting the contents of the report? Is that yeah. you, Nikki? Nikki, yeah. yep. And Bill, seconding. Okay, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Gary, thank you. Thanks, Moving to health and safety. Thank you, Patty. And we've got um, Alan. And me. No, we haven't. No, we haven't. We've got me. <laughs> and Alan. Um, good morning. Um, Matty and Chair, um, I'm here in moral support of the Health and Safety Manager, um, the People and Capability Director is on leave. Over to you, Alan. Um, well, morning, everybody. Uh, Ted report is read and happy to answer any questions if there are any. Any questions? Right, we've got Heath. Um, just one question on the, on the incident reports. How did they, how did they find the ammunition? In the, in the, yeah, I think the case, yeah. the, the case came over. The, the, the case that the ammunition had, uh, had arrived in the skip, I think it split open from what I seen. And then one of the uh, you know employees that's operating the lodges and things immediately spotted it and everything was started. It was really well handled. Yeah. So nothing did they Adam, nothing detonated. Nothing detonated. No, no. The, 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 still been in the case. <laughs> I've lived in South Otago for a while, and I've been to barbecues where people have thrown ammunition onto the fire, and nobody's run away. It's just <laughs> gone bang. And I think, obviously, with, you know, uh, obviously as a health and safety person, you've got to experience these sort of things <laughs> because there's no actual pressure from the barrel to fire it forward. It's it's probably going to go off more like a firework than anything else. But, but I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> test that. <laughs> That's what we should do. Well, and, and this is this is the thing is, you know, the the the, the teenagers that were so once the son of the and um, I think they're on holiday. Do you want to earn some money, boys? Clear out the shed, and that's how it came about. But um, I guess the nice thing is as well is that uh, their information sheet talks about explosives, and generally, explosives we're talking, you know, sort of thing. We don't think of ammunition, so it's nice to pick up on that that they've now gone back and explosives and ammunition. So um, you know, it's a bit more thought through and. South Otago, there's lots of people armed here. So, <laughs> for, for, for hunting and what have you. So, uh, silver lining one. Okay, any, oh, Nikki, yes. Yeah, so a very, this is a random question. It's a very good report that you do. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just an opportunity to ask a question. Um, just in terms of training, um, I'm just thinking of fire risk a lot lately and thinking of vapes that get thrown out and left on roadsides and dry grass and um, things like that. I'm just wondering, do we do training or, or require training for our contractors and, and things like picking up random rubbish that could, you know, cause a fire and not dropping their own? And sorry, it's a very random question. It just occurred to me when I was reading the report, the risk of fire is massive. We're investing quite heavily in it. Road verges to me, it's sort of a risky area. People just dump stuff yeah. online. I've just seen photos of vapes and lithium batteries just sitting in dry grass. I just wonder if there's an opportunity there in training our people who are often standing on sides of roads to um, sort of working on sides of roads, I should say, to sort of help pick up and also not create a problem in the first place. Um, so our waste contractors, they do do training through that type of thing because um, if you, last year, 
we had the scooter with the lithium ion battery that got into the um, um, waste pits and what have you. So there is that factor and that they are trained in this type of thing. As for our people, we kind of, I'd probably not because it's not sort of, that's not the type of work our people are doing. One would hope, that, and, and I do see it, I get phone calls saying, oh, I've found this out and what can we do about it? And, you know, um, we, we brought it back and disposed of it or we've reported it and someone's collected it and that type of thing. So, you know, generally, our, you, you know, if they spot it, they do something. Yeah, yeah. yeah Sorry, yeah. I'm not just thinking more of contract, roading contractors and so on, but it's just a thing that I thought. Well, Pushy, I think it's a good point that uh, the contract manager, like put down as that, just to remind them to keep their eyes open and be, be sensible because they're driving around all the time. Mm. And it's, I don't know if it's in their KPI or part of their contract, but... Uh, I have seen examples where, you know, not, not a hazard so much, but a road sign down, and they, they drive past it. You think, well, God, I've got to put a snap here in Solvent to get the bloody thing put back up. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, just, I'm just saying, general thing, they can drive around with their eyes open and and yeah, and yeah. get rid of any risky uh, type of thing on the side of the road. That'd be think, great. I think we could, um, you know, each year when the fire hazard season that comes into play, perhaps send out just a reminder to contractors because at the end of the day, even a weed eater or a, a mower yeah, can yeah. be a, a problematic. Um, I'm absolutely certain that they are aware of that, but we can certainly remind them, and I'm also it's sure that they, the keep them yeah, they, they, carry, they carry fire extinguishing um, equipment with them as well, as well. But yeah, we can certainly do that. Thank you, Dylan. If I may, thank you through the chair. Um, I think it's also, while it's very obviously a risk, it's, it's how much sits in council remit and that education piece around vaping in particular. Front row of the mosh pit at Electric Avenue the other day, I was horrified at how much people vape constantly through over hours and hours and hours. They were draining a vape in a day. <laughs> which is the equivalent of six or seven packets of cigarettes. No wonder they have the energy to keep dancing. Um, but that education piece, I don't know whether there's a way we can push that back on to the retailers of vapes. We really need disposal points at every single... If you're selling a vape, you should be almost one in, one out. It just seems to me we're sitting on a real mountain of um, lithium battery disposal with most of the users not aware of the risk. So whether it's that we need an education piece in schools and all their toilets, because that's where they're vaping, um, or, or whatever other locations that this, we've seen this groundswell. And um, yeah, I won't go into the concerns I have around the shape and color of them, as it's, far they also imply, but um, I just think we need to get a hint. If I may, through the chair, it's possibly outside the remit. It is totally outside the remit, but I just think noted it's and, noted and, um, and I think it's um, one take away potentially is to include something um, uh, highlighting that risk um, in, in our events. Um, side of things so that we can make sure that any event organiser is uh, uh, has their eyes open to that risk. Yeah, be a great place and events that people have to No have smoke, it. no vaping. Designated <laughs> vape disposal area and event management. We don't have to Up the front, <laughs> collecting good evidence. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any further questions? <laughs> If not, can I ask someone to move the motion? Thank you, Heath. Got a second there. Thank you, Nikki. All those in favour? Aye, Kerry. Thank you for that report. Right, we've got uh, climate and biodiversity plan update. Uh, to the uh, chair and uh, committee members, uh, it's a pleasure once again to provide. Sorry, Bill, just 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 for the committee members, it's, that's not Kirsty at the end of the room. Yeah, Billy. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Just in case you got that wrong. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that, Mike. Forgive me. Yes, uh, I will introduce uh, Polly McCall, who's the cover author of this report. Uh, she's our resilience yeah. and climate action advisor, uh, standing up for Kirsty today, and I'm sure you're well aware of Michelle, of course. Um, yes. <laughs> 
So uh, look at it. Once again, a pleasure to introduce this report to quarterly updates. It's the pro on the progress of the climate and biodiversity plan since uh, the, the December update. Um, I'd like to just draw a couple of key points uh, to your attention with regards to this report. Uh, we do, within this report, provide some information on a new initiative that we've just launched, which is the Climate and Biodiversity website. Unfortunately, there is a typo within the report, so if you are trying to access that link, uh, please just uh, remove the dub, 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 www, and type climate action into your search uh, function, and you'll find that new uh, website uh, available for use. Um, the website itself does have a register of all of the 70 odd uh, plus actions that are in the plan and also has progress updates against each of those. So within the reporting of these constraints today, we don't go into every action that we have underway in progress, uh, but that information is now available in the public setting. So the sound and the public can hopefully have greater, greater visibility and progress that has been made across the plan. Um, I also, with permission, uh, Chair, I just thought I'd make the notes on in response back to Councillor Gladdy, uh, who raised the question earlier with regards to funding. Yeah. So you may note in section 36 of the report, we do talk about, uh, I guess, the, the interactions and partnerships that we have with local not-for-profit organisations. Um, they are key partners on the work that we undertake, and we do reference them in the website as well. We have a variety of projects and funding arrangements in place, and it largely depends on the nature of the work that's underway. Everything does fully comply and give assurances with, with uh, procurement requirements, particularly over anything over 10,000 with the procurement plan. Uh, but from the position where the procurement plan is approved, it can either go forward as a services contract, and that's in relation to the delivery of a specific action that's in our plan. Um, the, the Food Resilience Network project is a good example of that. We've worked on this with WOW. They are in the position of managing that particular project. That's a services agreement. Alternate funding is can sometimes provided for a project that has been launched by a community organization, but which has strong alignment and connection into the seat of the climate biodiversity plan goals and, and objectives. Uh, the optimal biodiversity mapping project, which is undertaken by SLS and is referenced in this report, is a good example of that. So they have initiated, they are driving it, but we have supported it too, because it's a very important tool uh, for the future biodiversity uh, and conservation alignment uh, across the, the district. So it's just a couple of examples there that um, I hopefully address the question right on. Uh, I'll take the report as read and, and happy to take any questions. Any questions from around the table? Uh, yeah. Nikki? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. And then Lyle. Thank you yeah. for the website. It's, um, it's great to see that up and running. Um, I just, as I was reading through, I just thought um, about what is the best way to report stuff in terms of helping councillors to understand what's at risk and what's not and how much money is needed and where we're missing and where we're not. Um, and and I was wondering, we were talking about heat maps earlier for some of the CapEx projects. And I don't know, you have a very small team and don't want to overload you with work that's not helpful to you um, and helpful to the ultimate goal. But I just wonder if there are some... Um, you're, you have a number of, sorry, I'm keep talking, there are, there are a number of partners, different departments. I sort of went through there and wonder if there are certain departments that aren't perhaps keeping up with some of the actions as well as others, whether the stuff that sits within strategy and policy is more likely to get done because it's directly with the team than some of the stuff potentially in the planning space. Um, so just wondering if there was a way of reporting sort of, you know, orange, red, green, what's at risk? what's not, um, and maybe a little comment where resourcing is needed or this or that, so that elected members coming up to LTP investment decisions can go, this has been noted as a problem, because at the moment it's very hard to see where the money is going, where there's money missing, and where we could be doing more in the eyes. So I was wondering about that, sort of traffic light system, um, and I was also wondering about the um, indicator framework because we haven't kind of looked at the indicator framework yet, and I don't know whether it still fits the purpose, whether it's still something that you guys see as valuable, whether the kind of reference group sees it as valuable, but we haven't done any reporting against those indicators yet. Um, so I just thought maybe I'll just raise that as something yeah, to think about. You, you can certainly. Okay. Yeah. I was the first one in relation to the relationships we hold across the organisation. I mean, a significant proportion of what we do is based on our network approach in this space. So the strategy and policy team are very often either leading the projects or acting as the facilitator of a programme of works. 
Um, I think we try, we do capture it um, through the actions that are on the website, but behind the scenes in our own tracking abilities. Um, I would say that's a very operational piece, to be honest, that we, we, we would then, if we weren't getting the engagement we needed from a part of the organisation on a priority that's been set by our council, we would then escalate it through the managerial channels to be able to make progress in that space. Um, I think we can potentially surface things that by exception, are moving out, but there's often a very complex story behind why a team may not be engaging at quite the same pace as us. Um, as you're aware, all the different pressures that teams are working to on limited resources. So I think there is some space for brokering and rescheduling within this. Um, and by exception, we would flag if something significant was moving out. But in terms of red, amber, green, across all of them, I think that would become exceedingly complex very, very quickly. Okay. Um, yeah, it would be it would be helpful to understand because at the moment we're seeing the, the ones that are working, mm -hmm. but there are some that I know that maybe aren't. And well, it would be really helpful to highlight the ones that we just are not making progress on in a timely way and the reasons for that and what councils could do to mitigate yeah. any risks of non-completion. We do try to um, not only surface the good news in this report, but that is also to highlight anything where things aren't moving as we would like. Um, and we obviously have that same dialogue with the ELT well, as well. This is a long-term plan stuff because that's not been highlighted. And obviously one of the actions was to make sure that we had sort of a framework to assess what we were investing in and the impact of that on our climate reduction emissions reduction plan. Um, and we know that that's behind and it hasn't been done and, and that we're not Sorry, sorry, what's mine? Uh, sorry, I should have noted the action, but um, one of the actions around that long term plan. So, and it's been mentioned at the previous meetings, we're, we've acknowledged that. Are we talking about, sorry, uh, carbon accounting? Oh, yeah, carbon, yes. Oh, yeah. And yeah. That there is yeah, there's work underway. I guess we're looking at it from a CapEx and an OPEX perspective. Is that uh, yeah, to work in the CapEx space with regards to the strategic priorities? Is that, is that is something that's been presented to councillors that I've missed? Possibly. It was, it was done on the last LTP, the baseline piece of work. That was so completed not, last quarter, so now we're moving forward. Yes, we're moving forward. So we're looking at investment for the next 10 years. So nothing's come in front of us that's looking at, and I can find the action, but it might take a bit too much time. Um, that yeah, we're, at, running, we're running out of time. We are running, I know, I know. Um, but I, I guess the point is that running through there, there are some actions that I can see that probably aren't getting done and probably key ones like carbon accounting on our future investments um and i know we have to yeah that's, it's well, in the and i can there is progress being made i'm very happy to take i guess an overview of that so okay. perhaps, uh, perhaps i'm blind but we're that uh, yeah, that'd be right. there's a bundle program bundle of actions essentially um so the other thing a complex piece that we know but we uh, we also acknowledge resilience and, and climate emissions emissions reduction have been adopted as strategic priorities as part of that uh, the challenge with the forward program on yeah. the LTP is that it hasn't yet been landed. Mm -hmm. So to, to, to actually do that detailed assessment, which is quite an extensive process, um, hasn't happened for future programs. But we have done it. We have baselined at 21 LTP, which is more than any other council has done. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> I, guess, I guess it's how we use climate information to make our decisions. And when we get to that point, yes. councillors at a governance level are going, this is going to take us. Yeah, and this is involving the space. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but it's certainly very, very, very much involving for, yeah. for our emissions yeah. and for presenting the information in the future. Um, Project I, yeah. yes. And so we, yeah. it's part of the, I guess, the program approach we are taking. It is complex. There are a number of these actions that are underway, but we are bringing them into an internal change program. It looks at, it, I guess, addressing mm -hmm. quite a wide yeah. range of actions. Maybe part yeah. of. In the, we, we may, you may have to take that offline because we're running out of time. Yeah, I understand. I guess the thing is maybe some more engagement with the full council would be useful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Lyle, you had a question? Oh, but it was actually follow that. It was to do with that or the carbon auditing, the lag time, but I understand we've got the baseline and standing for the LPP. We can take some of the figures out of what historically you project. Uh yeah, there was just down at uh, page 88, uh, the super homes is the one guy. I was wondering what is the what is the value for money in this is contrast to affordable homes, I don't know what the cost is of the super home design guide, does that put the cost of building a house up? But I'm just understanding, are we you know, working with our affordable housing plan and all these other things? Um, it's a matter of how you balance things out here. Have you got any comment on that? Uh, I, I certainly do. Uh, through the chair, um, I think it is a complex space, Lyle, but yeah. Um, yeah, we've committed to promotion of, of best practice principles. Uh, ultimately, decisions are made, uh, I guess, by the homeowner, and they're always within the fiscal constraints that they do have. 
Um, but we have a part, I guess, uh, not quite a partnership, but we have a, a, a joined memberships with the New Zealand Green Building Council and also committed to supporting the super home movement. Both of those are, are two uh, vehicles that have been established within industry to promote better choices. Um, and sometimes the whole of life costs, for example, are much better. Yeah, yeah, I was very really understanding about yeah. how do you say about funding the, um, the update. I just don't know what, what, how, what, what yeah, they're talking about. There. The super home movement has, uh, which is based out of Christchurch, uh, a very strong connection with Southern Councils. Christchurch City Council has funded them previously for uh, various guidance documents. They are not for profits, they are there to advocate for better. I guess building practice. Um, so, on the basis of the, uh, the precedent of having other councils in there, we feel that that's a, it's been a worthy partnership okay. to, to establish as well. So, we are looking at once we do a, uh, see the materials that have been coming through to actively promote them through our channels uh, to ensure that anything that comes through the building team uh, has at least you know, some of those considerations have been factored into the design. Yeah, I have that page down on the with these what, uh, response. Groups uh, buying gear and you're buying gear for them. I, I might take this offline with you, but was it to do with uh, if they're getting gear? And I know Monica one buying gear. That's a matter of storage and insurance cover and things like that. But I'll take that offline. I think we'll yeah, yeah, we discuss it. that. Uh, no, I just don't do that. That's about it. Thanks very much. Oh, just down at uh, down Mount Iron, page uh, paragraph thirty four, page ninety one. Uh, Oh, have we got any other land that we, apart from Mount Island, that we... Uh, I don't know what I'm going to ask you. Have we got any other land? No, forget about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what that question was. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Okay, that. Wasting no problem. Time. Sorry. That's all right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm happy to move the noting of the report. Have we got a seconder? Yeah. Thank you, Nikki. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Carrie. Thank you. And thank Aye. you from the Aye. team. So we've got the Lakeview update and we've got Paul joining us. Morning. Morning. How are you doing? Um, Lakeview update. Let's go straight to uh, sort of the derivations from December um, on the Council Works program. Um, we're a further three months behind. That's um, on from the sunset date. I guess the uh, context behind that is the risk of not completing is um, minimal, if, if not zero at the moment. All the physical work to done. It's just some um, paperwork to be done at this stage. Um, um, and the other the other part to that is that our program or our completion program. Um, Choosing the title is aligned with the developer's program. Um, we're not completing it way early and we're, we're not holding them up. So that's probably a, another good context thing. And our budget is, you know, we, I think we did that budget back in 21 um, and, we, and we're still on track with that budget. So um, that's the context behind that. Um, the developer met with elected members last month on the 20th of February. Um, and just gave, a, gave an oral update on where they're at, but I guess the difference from last last year is they've gone from a, an off-market um, process, they're actually formally gone to market now, they launch up in Christchurch, um, and they've met their threshold, so they're, they're battling on with all their detailed documentation, so all their pre-settlement pre requirements that um, they're required to give to us before settlement, um, they're cracking on with that, and they've indicated commencement of their construction um, this year, which is good. Table um, one, two, um, just noting in table two around the developer's obligations, there's satisfaction of settlement conditions that's still to be confirmed. So once we've actually um, met well, completed the works, we can actually set a time frame around that, and I'll probably add another um, uh, another milestone in there, which is the sunset date, which is 20 months after completion. But at this point, uh, the developer looks like they're, they'll be well within that, so we won't be hitting any sunset dates for the next week. 
Um, then financial implications on um, just paragraph 15 there, just a, an update around there. That, and we covered this last time and we indicated it was going to happen, but we were expecting settlement in this financial year, but it looks like now we'll be uh, we start the next financial year or at least before the end of the calendar year. Apart from that, um, happy to take the report as read. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, any questions? Yeah, I'll have a hand up. Yeah, just a uh... Just to follow up on that. So, what are the yeah, maybe you or Stu can answer the implications of that uh, revenue not being available this financial year in, in our whole, all our planning and budgeting? Mm -hmm. Is it, what's the implication of that? It will, it will probably mean that we will have a diet, higher debt figure for the end of this financial year than we had forecast because we would have used that revenue to repay debt. But for receiving the next period, there's not a long term impact in that respect. We just pay it down when we receive it. Thank you. Okay, any further questions? Okay. Yeah, just one, thanks. Um, so it's just around ongoing operational costs of running the partnership. partnership. Um, are we tracking that? And is your assumption at 11, is that transaction costs of sale, are you including the costs of um, assessing variations and the experts that we need to pay for and the lawyers that we need to pay for? Is that assumed in there? But can we, I think it would be helpful to keep an ongoing record of um, the costs of working with 94 feet and dealing with the variations because I think there'd be more variations than I would have expected and there may be more coming in the not too distant future. Um, I think it would be helpful to track those OPEX costs. Um, yeah, so the short answer to that is yes, we do track those. Okay. Um, there was a budget established in 2017 for that and the council um, chose to do that work through the transaction options. So. Um, and yeah, there's a, there's a budget there and we're, we're well within that. So it's, I think the original budget was 1.4 million over the, over the transaction period. Transaction period being up to 20, 10 to 15 years. 10 to 15 years. So could we, could we have reporting on those costs against budget reported to? We do, we do them here. And it's in the transaction at this level. Um, I don't know whether you want to- see Sorry, them. here in the- yeah, so it's in, it's in the transaction cost of sale amount. It's no, no, so I'm talking about actual. So that's an estimate, right? You're 11, is that that's your 11 million? Uh, they're, they're, they're actuals at the moment. Yeah. So, yeah, so I mean, obviously that's for 10 to 15. Well, that, that's the extent of what you're planning to spend. I mean, this, the budget, the budget's we around, I think. Track actuals, that's yeah. what I'm asking for. Yeah, we do have actuals. Could we report actuals to the AUPRC? If you want that level of retail on every line item. I'd um, be interested in the cost over time of managing the yeah. overall transaction. So I think it was weighted about 120k per annum um, to start with, and you know, tails off towards the end, obviously, at the start. So yeah, pretty, yeah. pretty similar. My point is that 94 feet initiates variations at their discretion, mm -hmm. and we have to respond and we pay for the assessment of those. And that's quite costly because it involves a lot of experts. Um, so I'm just interested in, and then obviously you'll have the settlement process. So when you go through that, we've got lawyers, and then when you've got um, settling super profit and trying to work out super profit, you'll have yeah, so more experts calculating that. So I'm just interested in making sure that we track it transparently and that we can have some oversight yeah. of it. Yeah, so we set a budget back in 2017 for that. That gets updated every every 10-year plan cycle. It's about $120,000 a year, and we're well within that. I'm just asking, could we... Just to Paul, yeah, just to... Um, so you've got no concerns if the transaction cost of the sale, there's no... You're not concerned that there's... Uh, we're going to very... There's going to be a variation of this substantial amount from that. You still right. expect to deliver at that 11 million level. Great. Yeah, I think that's the uh, assurance that we need, Nikki. And if the, if they're not going to deliver within that 11 million, then we would need to understand uh, the variations. 
How are you making that assessment? Are you breaking it down into, I'm just trying to understand how you make that judgment, not understand, because we're, we're at the early stages. And we've, so, I, we, I guess, so we set a budget and we're within that budget. We yeah, I, I mean, for me, I don't understand why we wouldn't look at it. We look at CAPEX and we've got reporting year to date on individual projects. This is a key strategic project. Um, to me, we need some transparency and we need to understand what's happening and looking at the trends of, over if time. You get, if, you, if you go to 15, there are no budget cost or resource implications to consider currently. Yeah, we, we, we're talking sort of 80 to 100,000 dollars a year. That's, I mean, in the line in, in the OPEX cost of council, that's an incredibly small cost. I mean, if, if this confirmed that over time we're going to breach the total package of costs, then absolutely we would need to report that. But I'm, I'm sort of, I suppose, questioning at the level of expenditure, what the effort requires simply to produce that. Is Which worth. you're saying it's already there, I'm just saying deliver it to us. Yeah. And, we're tracking it, it's, it's sitting there, someone on someone's computer. With a track of what's how much is spent on what, all I'm saying is that the yeah. have some oversight of that because it is a project for which we are accountable as elected members. It is highly contentious, and I think it would be useful to show that councillors' governance is having oversight over that. At the moment, I can't can't tell you. I can't tell. Yeah, I don't know how much. I'm it's telling you, it's a hundred uh, eighty to a hundred thousand dollars a year, and we've been doing that yeah. project yeah. And we're not. We haven't gone over our estimate, so. If the, to me, that's when we need reporting, if there's going to be a breach of that number. Provided that's audited, and that's the response that came to the answer, then on, on that, we've that legal assurance at, at this level. And yep. we, we can, if, if we go beyond that budget, we're happy to include it in the financial section. Well, well if you're going to go beyond it, you've got to always be thinking out to 2039 or whatever it is. Yep. Uh, and going, are we going to succeed in it? So, it's a, it's a nominal figure, isn't it? Yeah. So the, the, the wording would be, instead of there are no budget costs or resource implications, we would get a report to say there are. And uh, so we just got to take at face value that there's no cost implications at this point. Heath. Thank you, through Mr. Chair. Um, question. So we are waiting on the planning department for code compliance. Is there any way we can prioritize that as one of the best clients? Uh, look, the, I, I think there's been a lot of collaboration already that's happened. Um, so my understanding is the infrastructure team um, signed off on, on the works on the QA aspect of it. I mean, I'm not, I, I don't know the detail around the PAA between the lines and the infrastructure team. My understanding is um, that work has been signed off, so now it can go to consenting. And um, prior to that, the consenting team received a lot of information, so I don't think there was anything new in that. There were a couple of outstanding requirements, so they should be able to get through that pretty quickly, my understanding is, so because they've already looked at it. Um, so the next step, which should happen in the next month, is it will go to LINS, um, and that's an external process around just getting title. But to, to your to your question, like we obviously don't favour or influence the regulatory <laughs> process. And the regulatory team operate under because it happens to be a project that we uh, that we're interested in. And still, that's all right. So I know you're being cheeky. Uh -huh. but, but equally, the private sector do have meetings with consenting. You know, so we, I don't think we've been treated any differently, and we haven't certainly haven't approached it any differently than we otherwise. It's been good to get it done, that's all. Oh. Um, and so just clarify for me, so the settlement of the first lots that are coming, that will be going through the first settlement, that's not full 88,000 of sales, is it? No, it's a, it's a deferred settlement program. We, we'll, we'll get all the titles for, for all the lots, yep. um, and then they'll be looking to settle on the first. So what's the, what's the quantum of that? Um, that's a bit, I haven't got all that detail at, at the moment. Um, that I can provide that. But that's not going to happen in this financial year. We'll be expecting this financial year that we push to next financial year, just a ballpark. Like, sorry. So we, we're saying that the, that that settlement's not going to happen in this financial year. It'll be no. pushed to next financial year. Do we have a ballpark of the quantum of that? 
that will be that's being pushed down. How, how much main payment? How much will be to set the amount? Yes. Yeah, it's the baseline payment. Sorry. Yeah. So do we know how much that is? Yeah, we do. Uh, yeah, I think. Well, it's, yeah. so you've got the it's total. The first, of, first payment. It's, you must yeah. be able to disclose the amount of the first payment. We've got the total amount as set. And we haven't provided that publicly in the past. So, um, yeah. so that's at this stage that remains commercial information. Yep. Yeah. Um, and just last question again. So we've seen the pre-sales come for the first stage. Um, very impressive or well, eye watering, depending on which side you're sitting on it. Um, have we got a bit of a feel about what that's going to do with super profits, given the high level of, of, of what the, the yeah the ex, well actually expensive in houses and stuff that they're selling in there? Is that going to be beneficial to us? If you can show me all the receipts for the construction work, and then give me all the receipts, all the invoices for the construction work and the receipts, then we can work out what the super profit is. But until we receive that, until that wash up happens. It's purely conjecture at this point. Oh, I mean, we have been told not to expect super profits until the end because it's only going to be based on uplifted land value that wasn't anticipated. That's, and we have had discussions, I won't go into any detail, but there is somewhat a lack of competition in the construction market for that type of build. It's exceptionally high <laughs> and there are limits. So, what, what I mean, got the impression from. What do you mean by the, I got the impression that we were to expect super profits. What, what do you mean by the end? What's the, the end? end? What's the end of your? So when, when did I? When say you say we we've been told we are expected by the. So end. I think the same, So we don't want to get to too much. I think I think the key thing that I, and I'm not sure whether we're completing statements. I, mean, I think effectively the transaction we entered into. Did not anticipate a super profit, but actually acknowledged the potential for a super profit. So it was, the transaction was based on the fact that we got back what we needed to get back into the land. Super profit is the um, it's the cream. cream yeah. it. Well, I didn't know whether that was a technical term. Sure, that was on my lips as well. So that's I suppose yeah. where, where we're so at. I want to rephrase that. Not be question more common to say by the level of pre-sales. It may tend to favour that there could potentially be a super profit, but maybe not. And I think that's a very fair statement to make. Yeah. To counter, to counter that, we would be looking at what you know, increased construction cost, cost. So, to to be clear around the super profit, I think it's an insurance policy against a change in the land value that was otherwise anticipated at the bid stage. So, the feasibility model that, that they put together. Construction cost, margin, a market value, and then there'd be a, a land payment component based on that. If if they the market outperforms or the developer construction outperforms, then there may be a an adjustment to that land value and the super profit accounts for that. So that's the best way you can look at it. And you know, there's a there's a post development. Um, requirement to to settle the, the super profit before each subsequent settlement. So it's a payment over time. So it's pure conjecture at this point to determine what that super profit might be until all the costs have come in and then all the revenues being received. Through the chair, I would say, and from discussion or from what lessons learned maybe that we need when we're considering variations to consider things like competitiveness and construction markets and financial markets for the changes that the variation might deliver. If you're going higher, there are some risks and I don't know that we fully thought about those when deciding to agree to a variation that went way up <laughs> beyond where we'd initially anticipated in the original master plan. So I think there's some lessons in assessing variations and what that might do to the potential for super profit. So be clear on that, we did consider that. Um, so as part of our commercial assessment, obviously CBRE helped us with that, um, having Look at the feasibility stage and the bit stage, and then looking at the ongoing feasibility. There, there is a there was a point where they would look at it and go, "Okay, is this something that um, would 
be outside of what was otherwise anticipated? And is there a, something to look at there? Um, again, that's something with the base land payment um, and some uncertainty around what future costs might be. It's a very difficult, um, a very difficult thing to sort of determine at the time. Again, try to deal with knowns in the stage and, and the mechanism within the super profit um, is an open book exercise where we, we get to make a full assessment at that time. What comment? Sorry, through the what comments did we receive back from our um, assessors from CBRE around the benefits of of going high and like doubling height? Did, did they consider sort of the maturity of our construction market in that space, or or not? I can't I can't remember the details. I mean, I have them buried somewhere in here, but yeah, I've got them on here. Well, that's that's what I'm talking about in terms of making sure that we assess what we need to. If a variation is put to us, given what that variation might do to our risk of not achieving super profit, because you know we talk a great game in the early days about you know achieving super profit and, and this might be good for us, you know we're going higher, but actually after we've agreed it and we have discussions, it's not looking quite as rosy from my um, my interpretation of our workshop. Yeah. Um. No, well, all I was trying to say is it was considered at the time and it's something we would look at in the future. I'll go back and give a read. Okay, that's been a good robust discussion. Thank you for that. I'm happy to move the uh, noting of the contents of the report. We've got a second up. Thank you, Heath. All those in favour? Aye. Right. Carried. Thanks, I'll now move Paul. that we move in to exclude the public. Thank you, Paul. Um, have we got a seconder for that? Yep, Heath, thank you. All those in favour? Carried. Uh -huh.